pleased to welcome Jishan Udin as this morning's presenter. Jishan is one of a team of authors who worked on the new Mindset for IELTS series and the author of the teacher's book for foundation level, which targets students at the A2 or pre-IELTS level. An EFL teacher since 2001, Jishan has taught on a range of courses in the UK and Spain, including general English, exam preparation and academic English courses. And he's currently an EAP lecturer and academic module leader at King's College London. He has extensive experience teaching IELTS preparation classes to students from around the world, particularly China, Saudi Arabia and Kazakhstan. OK, over to you, Jishan. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah, as Jessica correctly said, I, I'm the writer of the teacher's book. And what I want to do today is kind of take, a, take out some of the uh, key uh, tips and strategies in terms of teaching that, that I wrote in the book, as well as other things to help us to, to look at how best to teach lower level IELTS students, particularly with the idea of the mindset series of books. OK, so we're going to start with low levels because I think it's really important to set up good practice within the classroom. OK, so perhaps um, we, when we talk about low level students, maybe we're looking at students who are new to IELTS, but maybe also teachers who are new to IELTS as well. So there are some concerns maybe that teachers might have about this situation. So, for example, the movement from teaching general English to exam English, the common concern of is this the end of the engaging and interactive classroom that my students enjoy? Also, maybe um, teachers are going from um, teaching exam English and they're going to be teaching the IELTS exam, which is a multi-level exam where everyone, has, as I'm sure a number of you looking at the experiences, a number of you know, how, how can we best motivate the lower levels who are perhaps performing a bit weaker when in relation to into the, the whole IELTS exam. And thirdly, I want to look at how we can go from our students and us as, as new teachers to IELTS, how we can go from IELTS novices to IELTS experts. So this kind of common concern maybe amongst teachers who don't have huge experience of IELTS is, don't I need to know everything about IELTS before I can help my students? So these are the three concerns I want to focus on today. So it's in a way, it's teaching low levels, but also new people to IELTS, both students and teachers. OK, so in this talk, we're going to be looking uh, we're going to be using um, examples from the mindset series, particularly the foundation book, which I co-wrote the student book of and the teacher's book. So all the examples will be taken from this foundation level book. It's important to remember that it is a challenge to teach low levels, but also at the same time, it's an opportunity for them to develop good practice and for you to help them with that. So if you remember the three concerns, let's focus on the first one, the idea of how can we go from um, general English maybe to IELTS. So how can we get students into IELTS, into IELTS teaching initially? So if we remember, we said that we're concerned maybe that this is the end of the engaging classroom, the interactive classroom that our students enjoy that we enjoy and and it's understandable because you know maybe we're thinking this is serious now this is a high stakes exam perhaps we're doing it for university entry for visas for various things but it's a serious exam and also maybe we're thinking exam preparation could be quite boring and and the whole practice idea of practicing is it's repetitive and, and again boring is that really true well it doesn't have to be and the key is how we organize the materials and how we deliver them. And I want to look at a bit of both of those things, particularly the delivery in this talk. So I want to look at three strategies, three tips, um, two of which are quite low, low tech and one of which is quite high tech. The first two appear quite frequently in the teacher's book. And the third one is kind of how can we exploit the materials in the student's book even further? So let's start up. So start off with the first with the first um, strategy I want to talk about. So you can see a, you can see a picture in the top right corner, and it's a, it's a classroom where let's imagine a classroom where people are are talking uh, freely, perhaps in an organised way, but everybody feels um, comfortable enough to to contribute, and that's kind of a classroom that we want to want to have. On the left is a picture of uh, taken from the the foundation book. 
and it's a it's a task a multiple choice task quite a straightforward one that students have to complete on the right at the bottom you've got the teacher's book a, a, a snippet from the teacher's book which instructs teachers how they could exploit the feedback I'm you don't have to read that I'm going to explain it a little bit more uh, simply than this so what do I mean by avoiding the rubber stamp? So a rubber stamp is something where we, we put a stamp on something and say, yep, good, or no, not good. So basically, what I want to talk about is rather than immediately confirming correct answers when you go through feedback, I'm saying don't do it. And I'll explain why. So when you constantly say to students, OK, whoever answers first, they answer the correctly and you say, yep, that's right. What happens is the same stronger and more confident students always answer, as I'm sure you've seen in your in your classroom. And what that means, what that will lead to is that everything goes through you. And, and some students, maybe the less confident ones, are likely to disengage, thinking that they're not going to be asked and the teacher's going to rubber stamp, as it were, the, the correct answer. And what will happen is that students won't interact with each other and are completely dependent on you, especially at lower levels. So we want to avoid that. So what can we do? So firstly, when you go for a feedback, invite answers from, from students or nominate maybe reluctant ones. So this is kind of what we do anyway. But the difference is here. Rather than saying, yep, you're right, or no, that's wrong, don't say anything. Or don't, don't suggest that it is right or wrong. Simply invite other students to say if they agree or not. OK, you might want to, um, if it's a correct answer, you might want to pretend you're not sure so that students don't really know. And that kind of means it's open for students to add their comments. So when students say if they agree or not with the answer that another student's given, ask them to explain why or give reasons. Then invite more students to comment. What do you think? Is that right? Then after a few students have done this, you can confirm the answer. So what you've done is you've instead of just saying to the first person who got the right answer yep you're right you've asked for a number of opinions from different students asked them to explain it and then you've confirmed what the answer is why do we do that well for one it encourages peer input and greater involvement in the classroom remember we're worried that may maybe our IELTS classroom can be a little bit one-dimensional or a little bit non-interactive let's say so insist upon this in your classroom, insist on this peer input. Also, you want an active classroom where things like peer correction and peer assessment is common. Students learn really well from each other and their, each other's experiences as well as from the teacher. Also, by doing this, even at lower levels, we can create genuine discussion, discussion about what the answer should be. Is this the right strategy, for example? And it helps students learn and rather than simply as we saw in the first example it's it being a correct or incorrect answer it could be about opinions or it could be about best practice and students can learn by sharing opinions and best practice for the IELTS for IELTS tasks and that can help them improve further so that was avoiding the rubber stamp as I like to call it the second thing I'd like to talk about is this thing called open pair practice now what is it i'm trying to uh, with the image at the bottom I'm, i want you to kind of picture the teacher standing he's asking um the student on the far right to uh, work in pairs with the student on the far left in front of the, the rest of the class so they're doing a simple activity as you can see above the picture um basically they're having to construct questions and having to answer them and on the right, you've got something taken from the teacher's book, which basically um, ex explains how to do this. Again, you don't have to read this now. I'm going to explain what I mean by this now. So what do I mean by open pair practice? Basically, students are going to complete some pair work in front of the class who watch and have the opportunity to add input. So nothing high tech here. Let me explain it a bit further. We want to provide students with extra spoken, rehearsed practice, and that's key. They've already done this in closed pairs together. Now they're doing it in front of other people, and they've already practiced it. And what this allows for is peer input, advice, and correction, 
and it involves a more interactive classroom. Okay, I'll explain that a little bit more in a second. Also, it allows you to check on individual performances. So you can nominate certain students and you can really see how well they're doing. And also by getting input from other students, you can see how other people have understood the task and are performing. So how does this work? Right, as I said before, it usually works best after the pair work has already taken place and students have rehearsed, okay? So what you should do is nominate a student pair from different parts of the classroom. So someone from the left, maybe and someone from the right. This is so that everybody in the middle can see what's going on. If you nominate two people next to each other, the other students won't be able to listen in. If they're from different parts of the room, they'll have to, they'll have to listen and they'll, and you, they'll have to speak loudly to each other. So then ask the nominated pair to perform the role play or the discussion task. And then as students listen, ask other students to, to be ready to provide comments and input where necessary. So basically what we're doing is maybe um, at the end or even during the, the role play or the discussion that these two students are having, or it could be more actually, it could be three, you can ask students, invite students to comment and particularly at lower levels, maybe you can direct the discussion in terms of what do you want comments on. So for example, you could say, okay, Ahmed said X, whatever it was he said, is that correct? Or you can focus on the procedure, the strategy, the, the practice. So what did Shaw start talking about first? Why? Is that a good idea? So what you're doing is based on the performance, based on the dialogue or the role play of the two students in front of the class, you're able to generate more questions and generate more involvement. So invite discussion. And again, as we said before, only correct, confirm the correct answer or provide your input after. So it's a genuine discussion where students are learning from each other. So what's the result of that? Well, hopefully, Students are encouraged to listen and learn from each other, as well as provide peer feedback. And that's quite key. A lot of what I'm talking about is how we involve other people in the feedback, in, in terms of the, the peer feedback, and learn from how we learn, how students learn from each other. The classroom, hopefully, is a much more interactive place. And there's discussion, even at low levels, even simple, that's, you know, with, with simple English, Discussion does happen where people are comparing, discussing, is that right? Is that the best thing to do? Should it be different? So in this way, students can develop good practice as well as correct language, as well as, as you provide the confirmation and they learn from each other. And finally, if we look back at how we make our classroom like it is in general English, there's another opportunity for students to speak that's given here. So you kind of got uh, hopefully a more interactive classroom, something similar to how it would be in general English. The third thing I want to do, it. so the last two we've talked about have been quite low tech, let's say. You haven't really needed anything other than yourself and your students. But this one requires a little bit of technology, okay? So what you can see at the bottom is a picture I took um, about two years ago in my classroom at, at in university in London. I have to just say that the blackboard is it's quite unusual to have a blackboard. It's not in every room. But what you can see is you can see students working together, collaborating on computers. And what they're writing is coming up on the on the screen on the left. And what you have here is you've got the IELTS task, which is basically um, an email. So it's a, from the foundation book. Students have to write an email. You've got a checklist. and I'm going to talk to you about the value of the checklist in a second. OK, so when using um, when when doing this, what is it really we're doing? So we're using online tools, um, Google Docs or Word Online to basically help students to work together to create answers to tasks. And then with this, they can be peer and teacher assessed. Now, why are we doing this? So this gives students the opportunity to discuss and collaborate on work that they're doing together and then respond to peer and teacher feedback. So I'll explain that in more detail in a bit, but 
another way of looking at it is written tasks. It, think about written exam tasks. It makes them more interactive and discussion based. So rather than this image of students working quietly or even at home on a, on a piece of writing, this transforms it completely. So let's go back to my picture. On the left, what I've done is I've prepared an interactive document for students to complete their written work on, for example. I've used Word Online here, but Google Docs and others are possible. As you can see with the blue here, I've created a table structure in order for feedback to be written in the blue boxes. Feedback from you and feedback from other students when that when the time comes for that com comes to do that. Also, in the picture at the bottom, I put my students into small groups and ask them to share a tablet. It's really important that they don't have one tablet each because if you do that, then the, the act of collaboration disappears. I found three between, so one tablet between three works best. Okay. Now, what we're doing is the students are looking at the required written task. In this case, it's, uh, it's an email that they're writing. And then they are discussing, planning, and then completing the task on the provided linked document. So it does require you to do a little bit of preparation before the class and then supply the link, electronic link, to them so that they can work on it. So the students are working together. They've discussed the task and they're writing their, their email, for example. Mid-task, you can look at what they're writing by looking at the document and you can add a few comments like, are you sure you want to use that? Um, is that uh, check your article usage here, or um, have you answered all of the questions? Something like that, or is is something missing? And then that goes back to the group, and it generates more discussion as students basically are discussing. Okay, the teacher said that. Um, do we? How do we change that? How do we respond to that? Then finally, when they have completed the task ask groups to peer assess another group and add comments to the document. So group one, you can ask them to look at group five's, five's work and group five can look at group two's, etc, etc. Encourage and insist that students add, students add comments that are constructive. Now at low levels we may think how can we best guide students to give this very valuable peer, peer um, assistance? Well, Let's go back to the idea of a checklist. Provide them with a checklist. And this checklist basically guides them to what to say constructively. So for example, this checklist could be, does the student do this? Or did the group do this? Is this included? Something quite basic and they can use it to say, yep, they did that. Nope, they didn't do that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Now, once the group has made comments about another group, you can ask everyone to look at the comments for each for their own group and make some changes if they agree with the feedback or don't make the changes, but only after discussing it as a group. Finally, when providing whole class feedback, so at the end, you've done all that you've done the, the, the task, the feed mid feedback, so mid the mid input, you've done the uh, peer assessment. At the end, you can select certain examples from this document to show students and to kind of generate even more discussion to say, for example, OK, this this group did this. What do we think about that? Again, same as before, confirm answers later. One real, really beneficial thing about doing it like this is that students actually now have a written record of the work that they have done and their other their peers have done as well with the comments as well. So they can go home, they can look at it again. They can refresh themselves as to as to what it is they they should do next time to do this task well. OK. What are the results of this? So I'm hoping by doing this and I've, I've seen this with my own experiences, writing in class becomes much more interactive, collaborative and discussion based. So rather than, as I said, the image of head down working individually or even in pairs writing a task or even at home, Basically, it's become a discussion, it's been, become a collaborative task. 
And it's not just, it's not, it's no longer maybe an individual homework task as it may have been before. So it's not a case of, okay, finish this writing or do this writing task at home and bring it in and I'll mark it. And that's the positive as well. I said before, you need to prepare this. You need to do something beforehand in order for it to um, work, a bit of preparation. The payback is you don't necessarily need to collect in this work and mark it individually as, as before. The peer assessment has been done in real time. You've added comments in real time. You've clarified. So students have it already marked. And the key is that students can learn from doing, discussing, and providing and responding to feedback. So it changes the dynamic of the classroom in a, into a much more interactive, collaborative um, environment where peer feedback and learning from each other is generated. So I've talked about those three techniques, two of which are quite basic but could be very effective and one which requires technology. But again, if you have the technology, and I think most people do, or certainly students do, they can, you can use this to create this collaborative environment. So I want you to think about these two questions. So which approach have you tried in class before? What was your experience of it? Which approach do you want to try out, try out in your classroom? Please type your answers in the chat box. I'll just give you maybe one or two minutes you can answer both of them or one of them as you will okay thank you people are writing um, what they've tried Something uh, with um, something with some exp experiences would be would be interesting to find out. Okay, so people have looked at um, tell. That's good. Okay, open pair practice. Word online. Yeah. Okay, the collaborative. It looks like most people like the collaborative writing. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. It'll be interesting to see how that how that changes written tasks. Okay. Okay, that's good. So nothing seems to be rocket science here. A lot of people are trying different things out and have done in the past. That's good. Good to see. Okay, just one one more minute. So it's interesting. People have various have tried various activities. I'm hoping that that's helped create an interactive classroom. Okay, so let's now move on. In fact. Let's return back to, to mindset. So basically, we've looked at strategies, and the first two actually are from the teacher's book, from the foundation level of mindset for IOTS. Um, and the last one can be used to exploit, to, to basically extend the material in the book already. So this just, it's important to say that this, uh, this series is designed with this interactivity engagement in mind. So the topics that are chosen, as, as you'll see if you, if you look at the, the series, are very accessible and very personalizable. So they're topics that students can really relate to. Um, and pair work is, is um, created, is, is encouraged throughout the book. So we talked about um, how we should prepare our exam materials and how we should uh, deliver our preparation materials. And the book prepares it well and the techniques I suggest are a good way to deliver this. Okay, so let's move to let's move to the second concern that some of us may have had about multi-level exams. What I mean is, let's imagine you are teaching on the first certificate. Um, you're teaching first certificate, and it's it's a case of your students have to pass one level exam, high level, but still it's one level. Now you're moving to an exam where a low intermediate student will have to take the same exam as an advanced level, right? So that sounds for, for some of these lower level students, this is really difficult. I'm thinking of reading part three, particularly. All my students say to me that they, they question whether or not it's actually possible for even a native speaker to have the time to, to fully answer reading part three. Now, of course, the exam is designed to test everyone. So it has to have some very difficult um, activities and, and, and tasks. 
But what does that mean for motivation? How is it possible that we can avoid students being demotivated by some of the difficulty of some of these tasks? You know, students do it and they think that's too difficult. IELTS is simply too difficult for me. So how is it that we can maintain motivation for these lower levels? I want to look at that. So the key here is to develop good practice, something called a mastery mindset. I'll explain that and to ask students to reflect on their progress. Let me explain this in more detail. So a lot of the time, students, teachers, everyone is focused on the, their scores, the IELTS scores. What score are they? What score will they get? OK, and I, it's understandable, perfectly understandable. But at lower levels, maybe to avoid, um, avoid lack of motivation or a drop in motivation, focus on the processes, the strategies, the, the, the skills that students are doing. So transfer from what IELTS scores is a student likely to get to, what good strategies and processes is the student using? This is um, Carol Dweck, the picture on the, in the top left. And she set up something called, or she created a theory called mindset, mastery mindset. I like to say it's a happy coincidence. It has no connection to, to the book series. They, they have the same name, but they're not connected in this way. But it's, as I said, a happy coincidence. So in terms of mindset, this is the theory behind it. Basically, you have either a mastery or growth mindset or a fixed mindset, and they're very different. If you look at the table below, what you can see is you can see a growth or mastery mindset is the idea that I can learn. I can The process of knowledge attainment or getting knowledge can be developed through dedication and hard work. If I work at it, if I learn by experience, if I put together some strategies to do well, I will learn. Whereas the fixed mindset is the idea that you got it or you haven't got it. Basically, intelligence and talent are fixed. You can't really change that. You're either good or you're not. Now, for low level students, we need to move away from the fixed mindset and try to encourage a growth or mastery mindset. So we need that to maintain motivation for these students, because if we're totally honest, they're not going to be scoring high levels. They're not going to be scoring particularly high doing very well initially when they start learning to do the IELTS exam. How do we do this? Well, there's a phrase it says, praise the process, not the person. What does that mean? It means don't simply say, for example, that that's great. So you're, you're, you're really good. Um, you're very intelligent. Um, you're good at this. Maybe focus on that was a really good idea to um, underline the key words and to scan for those key words in the reading text. That was a really good strategy. And of course, to do this, you're going to need to teach good practice and strategies. IELTS, in, in many IELTS books, there are they, they, they give you lots of tips and there is a way of, of performing better in the IELTS through exam techniques and exam strategies. So we're kind of looking at that. Our students, and this is different, this is a key thing, Ask students to identify the processes and practices that they are employing, they are using. So what is it you did to answer this task? What did you, what steps did you take? And this leads us leads us to students evaluating the strategies that they used and they, I, they can identify some good practice. So basically they're saying, what did I do? How successful was it? Will I do that again? Etc. So. It's really important for you to insist on students keeping a record of their experiences and reflections of their progress. That's really important. I think if they simply recognize what they did verbally and and then didn't don't do anything about it afterwards, it's easy for them to forget. So firstly, forget what they did and forget that they have to do it again later. So students can use a checklist. Again, checklists are pretty good for low levels. They can use a checklist to identify what good processes and strategies they used. And this is really important. This is the learning part of it. Students can then identify what they'll try to do differently next time and why. And that's really important. Um, what worked? What didn't work? What will they do next time in order to do better? How can we do it? Well, there are a number of, a number of technological or tell um, bits of software that can help us here. 
On the left, you've got a, uh, an image actually I've taken from uh, one of my classes from Poll Everywhere. So a lot of the time, I want to understand how good, how confident students feel about a task in order to identify what's needed. And also, one good thing is to, to see a before and after snapshot of how students feel before and after they do a task. So a kind of reflection. So ask students to reflect on how confident they feel about certain tasks before and after they do them. So the images of poll everywhere, perhaps I've said, OK, how confident are you about multiple choice reading questions, for example? OK, so students do the activity. They look at the strategies they use. And at the end of it, you ask them, OK, how do you feel now? And hopefully students will feel more confident based on the strategies and skills and processes they put into practice. So we're not saying how well did you do? How many did you get? It's more about how what, what strategies did you use and how did it make you feel afterwards? Did you see that these strategies were working for you? If you want more detail, and this could be done in, in collaboration, basically with, with the poll everywhere, you can ask them using, uh, this is OneNote um, or Classroom Notebook, Class Notebook on Microsoft. You can ask them to write a detailed self-reflection. So for example, the first picture below the logo shows a student writing a few bullet points about what they did, um, how they felt about it, for example. And below, you've got maybe a self-assessment. So students are saying, OK, I did this really well. I didn't do that well. Next time I can do it slightly differently. This is how I would grade myself this time. OK, so ask students to write a, a mini reflection on what they did, what went well and what they think they will do next time. OK, the key or not, not just the key. In fact, one of the massive benefits of using OneNote or any other collaborative piece of software is that they can share this reflection with you. Perhaps it could be like a diary, a journal, or um, something like a log, where students basically write a number of these as time goes on, and they themselves can see changes, improvements, developments, for example. They can share that with you, with other students. There's something called Class Notebook, which is something to investigate, which basically puts OneNote documents together in class um, in class groups and you can divide them up into sections. <clears throat> so I find that's a useful tool. So what is it we want to hope, what, what, what is it we hope to achieve at the end of this? So as we said before, our concern was that students do a very difficult task with IELTS. Maybe the, they, they try the exam, they want to see what the exam's like, and it seems impossible and motivation drops as they can't see how they can possibly get there. Hopefully by fo focusing on the processes, the strategies, and collaborating that with reflection, students can see that their good practice is rewarded and that will motivate them further. They can see progress and they can tie it in with actions that they are doing. In addition, the skills that can be the skills that are learnt, the skills, strategies, tips, for example, they develop them and they can be transferred and upgraded as their students, low level students, language levels improves and their confidence improves. So as we said before, it's this idea of um, embedding good practice in early and it's a great opportunity with low levels to put in good practice now so that when their language level reaches the level required, or the level they need it to be in order to perform as they want to, they've already got the, the skills in place. Okay, and they can, and the key is that they can see that these skills are really helping them. So let's think about some questions in relation to this idea here. So have you tried any of this before in class and what was your experience? And how do you encourage good practice? Please type in your answers in the chat box. You might want also want to consider how you maintain motivation levels at, for, for lower level students as well, if you use any of these, these ideas.
Okay, so people are, are, are looking at how they praise. That's, that's important. And as I said, it's about praising the process rather than the actual student themselves, if possible. That's nice. Also, looking at analyzing mistakes and how they can improve and, and seeing progress. Yeah, lots of people are saying praise. Um, and, and as I said, that's that's a good way. But try, as I said, make sure the praise is based on what they're doing. Because that's always a good way to help the ones that aren't doing as well, help them to, to use the same strategies. Yeah, I've seen a learner diary. That's an interesting one. As I, as I said, with the OneNotes, you can really create um, learner diaries. But what the key the key is get students to look at each other's as well. And you can have an eye on them as well, keep an eye on them as well. By looking at each other's, what you can see, what they can see is they can learn from each other. And that's also, that's a big theme of today, actually. You can, you've already seen, I'm sure, is, is how we can encourage people to learn from each other, students to learn from each other, because they are valuable resources. Okay, so we're looking at focusing on processes. That's good. Okay, so thank you very much for that. Let's move on to the um, final part of the part of the uh, presentation. In fact, sorry, before that, let's come back. Sorry, to mindset. So, how is it that uh, we try to encourage uh, motivation levels to, to to remain high? Well, similar to um, similar to the to uh, many. Uh, books, but particularly for IOPS, we um, obviously for each level, language tasks are all graded. So um, students don't have to do a full IOPS style exam within the book. However, it's similar to the exam. So that kind of helps in a way. It's much more accessible, easy for students to do. This is not so different to other IOPS books, perhaps, but what is different is that there is an online module, or there are online modules that accompany this book. They focus on skills and language focus, as you can see. You can see here in this, this screenshot. Now, how can we use these? We can encourage our students to take responsibility for self-study by using that. And we can tie that in with um, self-reflection, progress, looking at how um, looking at how our strategies are used are, are being used. So students take responsibility for these extra modules, these extra bits of work. They try to practice the strategies that, that they have identified as being good, they write a log to say what they did, what they could do better. And it allows you as teachers to keep track of their progress as well. So it's quite a nice little extra added to the book. And it helps us with this idea of self-reflection, practice and post-reflection to see what they could do better next. So now let's move to the third part of this talk. So. Basically, remember, I, I want to focus on students and teachers who may be not IELTS experts. I know many of you have got huge experience of IELTS, but some maybe don't. But how do we get our students and us at the level where we can become experts at IELTS without taking too long as well, without spending too much of the class, the valuable class time? So you might be thinking, don't I need to know everything about IELTS? before I can fully help my students? Don't I need to be the IELTS expert, the IELTS guru, let's say, before I can help my students? So you, you might be thinking, how can I help my students if I don't fully know everything about the exam? Or how can I make the balance? So you, you know you need to learn and the students need to learn about the exam. How can I balance it appropriately, make this balance between helping my inexperienced low-level students improve their English, which of course they must do, but also, helping them to become familiar with the exam. If you do one, does that not take up, take up, up time of the other, for example? It's, it's tricky to balance both of them, of course. So what can we do? OK, basically, a quick and easy thing to do is to familiarize yourself and your students as you teach and as they learn. And how do we do that? One key is to make the learning outcomes transparent. What, what are the learning outcomes firstly and why? Why are students doing this and how does it help? Basically that type of thing. So what are we doing? 
So we're keeping students informed all the time. The book is designed like that. Students are told every opportunity why they're doing the tasks being asked of them and how importantly, so importantly, how they relate to the IELTS exam itself. And why do we do this? I don't know if you noticed, but I've noticed my students these days, I've noticed a change over the last 10, 15 years. And um, students want to know why they're doing things. What does it relate to? How does it relate to the IELTS exam? How does it relate to the, the thing that they need at the end of it? So they want to know how the task they're being asked to do will help them in their exam. Okay, and that's an understandable um, desire from the students. And lower levels, by doing this, lower levels can familiarize themselves with the exam by by doing it bit by bit. And I'm going to show you this now. So I've taken this. This is unit five from the foundation book. And this is a screenshot of it. As you can see, it's all about food. At the top, you can see what the outcomes are. There are four outcomes. Identifying different ingredients, for example, using singular and plurals, giving descriptions, speaking about a meal. Now, those are, it's really good to have, be uh, clear about what it is we're hoping to achieve. So what do we do? So we identify the learning outcomes and we explain these to our students. So we don't talk about all of them at the beginning of the of the chapter about of the unit. We talk about these as we come to them. So, for example, um, when you're going to identify different ingredients and categories of food, for example, then you focus on that and explain it. And then when you move to the grammar section of it about singular, plural, countable and uncountable, that's when you focus on that outcome, for example. OK. What you're going to do is you're going to show how show your students how these outcomes are connected to the IELTS exam. Which sections do they prepare them for? And that's really important because students at foundation level, this book, for example, aren't quite ready yet to really. I wouldn't necessarily be keen for them to take the exam too soon. And they are that they need to become more familiar with with the, the nature of the exam. So it's important for them to understand what it is they're doing and how it connects to the exam. So this I've taken, I've taken this from the teacher's books. On the left, you've seen I've broken it down into, into outcomes. So this is the first outcome. I've asked teachers to focus on this outcome, ask students to look at this outcome together. So what I've asked teachers in very simple English, I've asked students to tell students, I've asked teachers to tell students what they're doing and why. So they're going to be looking at vocabulary um, for talking about food. And it will help them because in the exam, this is quite a common topic. And to be able to talk about favorite foods and from cultures and countries can help them do well in the spoken part of the exam. So what's the result? Students and teachers hopefully will become more familiar with the nature and expectations of the IELTS exam as they encounter these outcomes. So you don't have to know all about the exam. This the teacher's book will tell you what this outcome is and how it relates to the exam. And hopefully student motivation is improved as they can see the direct relevance between exercise, the exercise they're doing and the exam task. Um, just seen a couple of uh, people say that they can't see the slides. So I'm just going to start, go back and re reload it. OK, so I'm hoping maybe in case for those students who couldn't see this slide, I'm hoping that they can see it now. OK, I'm not sure what this can anyone see this slide. OK, OK, so maybe it's a local issue. OK, OK, fine, fine. Um, hopefully uh, it, this is being recorded, so hopefully it won't be too much of a problem. And hopefully it works again soon. So to reiterate what you've got here, just to say it again, You've broken it down into, into outcomes, you've explained it, why we're doing it, and how it connects to the, to the exam. Quite straightforward, quite basic, but really important to maintain student motivation and to help you and your students learn about the exam without wasting time doing lots about the exam, exam technique and the nature of the exam and losing time for, for focusing on language. OK, so lots of yeses here. That's, that's good. OK. So let's now think about some questions related to this. So again, answer both or one of them as you will. How often do you explain learning outcomes to your students and how they relate to the exam? Is this something you do often, always? Is it maybe something you think, I don't actually do this that much, 
but I might think about doing it. And also, this is an important thing. Do you agree that you can learn about the exam as your students do? Maybe you're a little bit ahead of them, let's say, but not hugely. Please type in your answers. Okay, so we can see uh, people are often or always explaining it. Okay, it's important for exam preparation. Interesting, some people at the end of the task, at the end of the week, some people for before the tasks. That's interesting. At the beginning of the unit, sure, sure. Now, I think what's important, this is only my opinion, if you do it before you do the next task, before you do the task related to that outcome itself, maybe that helps it keep it fresh in the mind of the students. Yeah, I can see people right in high school having to, to, to have outcomes. Yeah, in, in this country, we have these, these outcomes that have to be very explicit, very obvious to our students. How about the second question, though? Can you learn about the exam as your students do? OK. People are confident with that. That's good. Because we don't want to waste too much time ourselves investing times in the exam and learning about the exam and explaining our student to our students exactly everything about the exam. OK, great. That's good. So back to the book, as you can see in the with the screenshots, we um we have separated the outcomes and in in uh, for the foundation book it, at low level English so that you can explain to your to your low level students. We've, we've identified why we're doing certain tasks how they will help. So as I said, they're divided up in the teacher's book. They're explained clearly. And it, it's basic things like tell students that, explain that. So it's very easy for you. You can simply just read it to them. And it makes all the activities relevant to them. So they have the, the exam in mind. Even if they're a bit scared about it, they have the exam um, in mind for that. OK. So we've looked at um, these three concerns that are typical and totally understandable that new uh, that low level te teachers teaching lower levels who are new to IELTS or the teachers themselves are new to IELTS. Three common concerns. So the first concern was I'm moving from general to exam English. Does this mean everything changes? We, we, we change from being this very vocal, verbal, spoken, fun, interesting, interactive classroom? No, we don't have to. I've shown three tips, and there are many more, of course, and I'm sure you do them. You, you have your own strategies. But I've shown three tips where the way we prepare the material and how we deliver the material, how we organize the material and how we deliver the material is key to, to creating or recreating this very um, this very interactive classroom where everybody is happy to contribute. The second concern we looked at today was how we move from a single level one to a, a multi-level exam, basically from first certificate to IELTS. How do we keep the motivation levels up for the low level students who are looking at a very difficult task and think things and, and, and it's understandable. think I, I can't do that. I'll never be able to do that. Well, the key here get them to practice and develop good good practice, good strategies, good processes, create and nurture a mastery mindset. Remember the idea that with good practice and learning, I can improve. And that's done by asking students to reflect on their, their progress and you praising their progress, their good practice. Finally, we looked at how we go from IELTS novices, maybe students particularly, and maybe us, maybe, to IELTS experts. The idea that I need to be an expert in order to help my students. Well, we can familiarize ourselves as we teach and as they learn by, by making learning outcomes transparent and relevant to the tasks that they will do in future. So that brings me to the end of this webinar. We're going to have questions very, very soon. And, and uh, these questions have also been collated so that I will start by answering those. But thank you very much for, for, for watching this. I hope this has been useful to you, and I hope that there, is, there are examples here or that you can employ and use in your, in your classroom. 
and it help, helps with the with lower level students to, to improve engagement, improve um, improvement and development in their in their skills, and helps them to to start the IELTS journey successfully. Thank you. Thank you, Jishan, for that really interesting session. Lots of great ideas there. So as Jishan said, we're going to take some questions now. So please do type them in the chat box, and then we can um, ask Jishan. So Jishan, okay. while, while we're waiting, um, I had a question. So um, you talked a lot about the pair work in the first part of your presentation. But what about, I know in some um, cultures, um, so students aren't particularly comfortable working in pairs. What what would you recommend? That's an interesting one. I, I hear that um, quite a bit. It's difficult, and there isn't a really really easy solution to this. I mean, I want to say please try to persuade them of the value of pair work, um, because it it's really useful. And, and a lot of books have been designed, general English and exam English, with pair work in mind, because the idea of the, communi the communi communicative learning environment is that we need pair work. So I suppose sensitively, you can find out what the issue is. Why is it that students don't want to do it? Is it uh, cultural? Is it the person? It, I mean, it could be a number of things. Try to find a solution. Um, rearrange, maybe rearrange pairs. Um, maybe uh, look at alternatives but if you can try to try to create this pair work I suppose one other way of doing it is um, the writing pair work or writing group work can be done separately I suppose on um, collaborative documents it's not ideal doing it like this but I would say my first choice first thing would be find out what it is what's the reason that there's this um, inertia this um, this resistance to to pair work and try to overcome that um, maybe it's the idea that people don't want criticism or they don't want other people to uh, to negatively uh, comment. I don't know, something like that. There are always solutions. Maybe you can uh, train your, t your students to, to um, give constructive feedback. That might help. Great. Thanks, Tishan. Um, so we've had a couple of questions come through, and please keep typing your questions. We've got um, a good five minutes to, to answer them. Some We've had a couple of people ask if there's a teacher's book for mindset. Yeah, that for each level, um, there is a teacher's book. Um, I actually wrote the foundation level teacher's book, and um, a, a number of these activities that have come out today come from the foundation level teacher's book. So yeah, there is there is one. And um, you should be seeing some links in the chat box that uh, where you can find out more about the mindset course and what's available. So another question from the floor. Um, reading is usually the most complicated task. How to help students who are not very analytical? Any ideas for that? OK, so um, by analytical, I'm thinking the, the kind of attention to detail, trying to look at hidden meanings or deeper meanings particularly at high levels or even I suppose even lower levels I'm just trying to understand that so what can we do hmm. I think as we talked about when we looked at the motivation section if we um, if we break down what is analytical into um, steps so for example a process let's create a process what does analytical mean is it firstly it's to read to read it understand the, the 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 main meaning of it maybe identify why the writer has said that I suppose that creates a critical analytical approach perhaps breaking it down into what does it mean to be analytical and what steps need to be taken and again as we talked about with uh, the self-reflection we can add that to our student am I doing this when I read am I doing a and B and C for example I suppose that's what I would say would help with this. Thanks, Jishan. Um, okay, another question that's come through. Mm, which materials are the most useful for beginners? Is okay, so would recommend? We, okay, okay, so we're talking about uh, IELTS preparation for beginners. Now, I think um, this 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 uh, the, the series starts at foundation, which is at a higher level than 
a higher level than than for beginners. So it's difficult. There isn't much out there for IELTS beginners, students who are beginners. Um, so that's quite tricky to do. But what you can see with the book is the language has been graded. And also the tasks have been graded as well to reflect IELTS, but not be completely IELTS tasks. If you wanted to get absolute beginners into IELTS, and maybe you don't, maybe you actually you'd rather they focus on general English first. But if you did want to get them into IELTS, what you would have to do yourself would be to grade the look at the tasks in foundation, maybe grade it even more to make it more basic and look at how you would um, grade the language in order for these tasks to be accessible for beginners. I have to say it's quite a difficult, a, a big challenge to, to be able to, to, to do exam material for absolute beginners. You might want to focus on the general English route first. And when they're ready, so Mindset IELTS is for A2, I believe, foundation. When they're ready, they, they, it may be best to do that. But if you did want IELTS for beginners, absolute beginners, I would say you're going to have to grade it slightly and make the tasks even more basic where possible. OK, thanks, Jishan. Well, we've got a, one more minute if anyone has a, a last minute question for Jishan. Um, but for those of you, I think there were quite a lot of people who came in um, halfway through the webinar today. So there will be, just to remind you, there will be a recording of today's webinar on our blog um, next week. And hopefully you, you can download your certificate. That, so there's a link on the screen now. Um, and also, we've got another webinar for IELTS, this time focusing on higher level speaking success. And this one is on the 23rd of August, so please do join us. So I want to say a big thank you to Jishan for his really interesting and informative presentation today. And um, we look forward to seeing you all sometime in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jishan. Bye, everyone. Bye.